Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, this week, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Ewan Pearson to Grand Rounds. He's no stranger to Grand Rounds, presented many times over the many years we've been doing this. And when he was uh, in charge of DCAT, he uh, merged with us uh, so that the DCAT lectures were presented through the Grand Rounds. I think that was a very successful format. And if you want to see any of the DCAT lectures, they are on the Grand Rounds YouTube channel, which you can get to just by searching Dundee Grand Rounds on YouTube. Um, and they are in their own separate channel. So you can go through them. A series of really amazing lectures by people who um, at the time were eminent people in their fields. And actually, um, so a lot of the, the research that was presented at those things has turned out to be really important in, in, and come into the news and, and, and developed into really amazing life-saving stuff. Speaking of amazing life-changing stuff, Ewan has been involved in uh, the cutting edge of diabetes <coughs> research since as long as I've known him, when we were registrars here, um, and then into consultancy. Um, and uh, the I think it's a fair thing to say that the diabetes world is really in Dundee it really leads the country Europe and in the world in many ways in terms of the the, the research output and and how it changes the lives of our of our patients with diabetes so I'm pleased that Ewan is going to speak for us today about uh, precision medicine in, in in diabetes um Ewan and I have known each other a long time we went we were at medical school together although we're not telling you when that was <laughs> we were at medical school together um many moons ago Ewan, thanks very much for being here. Uh, any questions, please put in the chat, questions at the end. Great, thank you very much, Tom. Let me share my slides, give a, a shout out, Tom, if those are showing. There you go, that's fine, we can see everything. Okie dokie, so thank you, Tom. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk around um, uh, an exciting new initiative um, that we've just had funded around implementing precision diabetes care in Tayside. Um, but I'm, that's more towards the end of the talk and, and much of the talk is around sort of telling a story of how we got to this point of, of being able to implement precision diabetes care. Um, if my slides advance, yeah. So firstly, let me just tell you briefly around diabetes care in Scotland. Um, you will all be aware, those of you who look after patients in acute medicine and generally that there's a lot of diabetes around um, and we've had a 31% increase in diabetes between 2010 and 2019 and diabetes accounts for about a billion pounds per year of healthcare costs with 12% of all inpatients having diabetes. Now I'm sure you also know that Dundee is a, a place where there's quite a lot of um, deprivation and with deprivation really goes diabetes, much higher prevalence um, in those most economically deprived populations across Scotland, which of course is associated with obesity, smoking. And if you have diabetes, generally your diabetes is less well controlled. But also diabetes is not just a disease of sugar, it's a disease of many things. It's a multimorbid disease. Um, so 40% of hospitalized patients with heart failure have diabetes. It's characterized by liver fibrosis, 16% of patients with have, with have severe liver fibrosis, um, and a quarter of patients starting renal replacement therapy have diabetes. Now, unfortunately in Scotland, and this isn't just a problem in Scotland, it's a problem in the UK more generally, um, is that we don't manage diabetes as well as we should do still. Um, so about 30% of type 1 diabetes and 70% of type 2 diabetes have an HbA1c above 9%, um, so which would be poor diabetes control. We don't es escalate treatment when we should do, so the mean HbA1c at which we start the next drug in diabetes is 8.7%, whereas our targets are down at the 6.5%, 7.5% level. And actually, when you look across Tayside and Fife, and we've looked at this across all the GP practices in Tayside and Fife, there's a very random allocation of treatment after metformin so people are either in fact one GP practice might only ever give sulfonylureas and another GP practice might never give sulfonylureas they might only give DPP4 inhibitors so so there, there's an element of 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 randomness there and, and generally non-ideal care and and what what we're hoping to do in this new initiative that we call iDiabetes or intelligent diabetes is use informatics and precision medicine to improve this care. And that's what I'm going to come on to. 
But one of the reasons that the care is, is challenging and, and certainly why we probably see this random allocation is that the guidelines that we have, and there's, these are the ADA ESD guidelines for the management of type 2 diabetes, um, are maybe not the clearest, um, and we have many, many drugs that we can now use. Now, to some extent, things have changed a lot in the last few years because, as you know, um, anyone who's, who does acute and general medicine will know that there's a lot of drugs now being used, particularly SGLT2 inhibitors, which have been shown to be beneficial in kidney disease and heart disease, heart failure, um, even in the absence of diabetes. So these drugs are really um, taking off. So if you have heart disease or kidney disease, there are now some clear indications for, for which drugs should be used. So SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. But probably two thirds of the population with type 2 diabetes don't have heart failure or kidney disease. And for them, you can see there's a choice of many different drugs. And the confusion really is, is how do you decide which of these drugs to give to whom? So if we take GLP-1 receptor agonists, for example, we know on average that these are good, really good drugs. They're potent, they cause weight loss. We know that they have cardiovascular benefit, but they're expensive and they're largely injectable, although we have an oral version now. But all of these data come from clinical trials. And all those clinical trials always group patients together to give us an average effect. What we want to know when we're treating a patient with a GLP-1 receptor agonist or any diabetes drug, or you could argue for any drug that you use in your field, you actually want to know how they're going to respond. So we want to look at individual factors like ethnicity, about their phenotype. Um, in diabetes, we're interested in insulin resistance versus beta cell deficiency. You know, do people who are insulin resistant respond differently to different drugs? What about genetics? Does that matter? Um, what about other things like the gut microbiome? So bringing all of this information together is really the area of precision medicine and specifically here, precision treatment. So adding additional information on risk, drug outcome and side effects for an individual to better enable that doctor and patient decision. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, and this will lead to the implementation framework of eye diabetes. So firstly, we need to recognize that there is considerable heterogeneity in the phenotype of patients with type 2 diabetes. Here are patients with diabetes, and you can see that they're all different, uh, ethnic, eth ethnically different, um, slim, obese, old, young, and Currently, those treatment guidelines don't really recognize these differences in how we treat our patients. Four years ago, there was uh, really quite an impactful paper in the field. Um, it's been much discussed, much debated, um, and, um, and I won't go into that in, in a huge amount more detail. But the concept here was that you could cluster people with type 2 diabetes and come up with these different subtypes of diabetes. So they described these five subtypes of diabetes, one of which, which is the gray one here, 6.4%, is essentially type one diabetes, so autoimmune diabetes. But everyone else here was previously classified as type two diabetes. And they identified these different subgroups on the basis of whether or not they were obese, whether or not they had um, reduced beta cell function or they were insulin resistant. And it, on the surface, it looks very elegant that you could start to tease out these different subgroups of people with type 2 diabetes. We and others have done some similar analyses. And actually, when you do this yourself, you realize that there's no clear boundary in this way. And actually, there's a huge amount of overlap. So it's really hard to say whether someone is subtype um, MARD, MOD or SERD, because it's really difficult to actually predict. So we've applied a different approach. Um, and this is work that Anna Nair has done, who was a PhD student with me and is now a postdoc in my group. Um, and we took data, this is clinical data from Tayside and Fife, uh, data that's come from Sky Diabetes. Um, and the joy of the data that we have is that you can track everyone back through time and find out when they were diagnosed and look at their phenotype, their clinical characteristics when they were diagnosed. So what we've done is we've taken nine clinical measures. So you can see what they are here, HDL, HBMC, BMI, blood pressure. And we have 
um, essentially undertaken a dimensionality reduction approach. So you take those nine measures and you collapse it down into a two dimensional tree. And it produces these very nice pictures. And what every dot here is a person. Um, so someone up at the top left, you can see here, has got a very high HDL. They've got a low HbA1c. Um, they might have a high cholesterol, but a very low triglyceride, for example. Top right, much more driven by blood pressure. Bottom right, these people have got higher BMIs, much more adverse lipids. So you can see just by using this approach that we can we can visualize how people are different with type 2 diabetes. And that's interesting, but is it useful? Does it matter? Well, what you can then do is look and see, well, do these people who are different in this tree, do they have different outcomes of their diabetes? So you can look at progression to insulin. So people up at the top left don't progress very quickly to insulin, whereas people down at the bottom right, that high triglyceride metabolically added first group progress much quicker to insulin. Down at the bottom is the area that's risky for heart disease, MACE, or for chronic kidney disease. And up at the top right, which is that high blood pressure arm, that's really what's driving that retinopathy risk. So where you are in the tree does matter for your risk. Um, and it also matters for how you respond to drugs. So what we've done here is we've taken um, the Scottish tree, that tree we've derived from those people from Tayside and Fife, and we've taken a clinical trial um, called the ADOPT study, and we've taken everyone from the trial and mapped them to essentially sort of a twin, and a, a, a proxy person in the Scottish tree. And the first thing you can see is that there's lots of grey, and that's because trials are not very representative of the real world, so there's lots of people in the real world here who aren't represented in the ADOPT trial. But beyond that, what you can see is that um, people down at the bottom right fail quickly on metformin and fail quickly on sulfonylureas. But the, the pattern that you see for the drugs thiazolidinediones, pioglitazone, is quite different. Actually, it's the people down at the bottom left fail quicker. So again, what you can see here is where you are in the tree not only determines your risks in terms of complications, but also determines how you're going to likely respond to drugs. And then what Anand has done is generate this shiny app um, that you can access via this QR code that allows you to enter the clinical characteristics of a patient that we have in front of us. And I've deliberately chosen what we might think of as quite a typical Dundonian person with type 2 diabetes, who's clearly metabolically adverse with a, with a, a high BMI and a high HbA1c and a high ALT. And actually what this does is it shows where he falls on the tree. And I've deliberately chosen these parameters to make him right down here. He's the red dot right down in this extreme. And then for him, we can see that his risk of progression to insulin is about 30 percent in five years. And although he's 40 and therefore his absolute risk is relatively low for things like heart disease, he's actually got a 10 percent risk of developing a, 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 a cardiac episode to MACE over the next five years. Whereas this chap is older, slimmer, he's metabolically better, he's got high HDL, and he's up here in the tree. And you can see how for him, his risks are different. Now, in part, just because of his age, um, he's, he's still got a high risk of developing MACE because he's 75, so he's got a 30% risk of MACE. But his risk of progression to insulin over five years is very low, under about 5%. So hopefully what you can see is that the phenotype of diabetes matters um, and we largely don't use this phenotype in any of our management at the moment. So let's then think around how we can use the phenotype to predict response to therapy and hypoglycemia risk. So over the last seven years or so, I've been working in a consortium that's, a, that's UK wide, um, that's largely between Dundee and, and Exeter. And John Dennis has done a lot of this work, who's a, um, a, a, a PI in Exeter. Um, and we've shown that clinical factors determine how people respond to drugs. And there's papers there. I'm not, not going to go into all of the data. But what's really, it's all very well showing that BMI mean a high having a high BMI means you're going to respond better to a drug what you really want to know 
is whether having a high BMI means that you respond better to one drug as opposed to another drug, because that allows you to choose one drug over the other drug. So we're looking really for differential response to therapies and how phenotype or clinical features can influence that differential response. What John has shown using primary care data from CPRD, this is a UK wide um, research uh, database. Um, on the left, we see BMI, on the right, EGFR for four different drugs, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, thiazolidine dimes and sulfonylureas. And what he shows is that, um, that people who are, have a higher BMI respond better to thiazolidine dimes, and people with a lower BMI respond better to sulfonylureas and DPP-4 inhibitors. And if you look at EGFR, people with a higher EGFR respond better to SGLT2 inhibitors, and people with a lower EGFR respond better to the other two drugs. So you can see differential response here. So using this clinical data, we established two hypotheses, basically that if your BMI is over 30, you do better on a TZD, and if your BMI was under 30, you do better on a DPP-4 inhibitor. Or if your EGFR was greater than 90, you do better on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and if it was below 90, but still not in the CKD range of, of, with an EGFR 60 to 90, you do better on a DPP-4 inhibitor. And based upon this observational data, we set up a clinical trial. And this trial was called the TriMaster trial. And what's quite cool about this trial is that we deliberately set this up to try and investigate a precision medicine um, model. Um, and so it's not your usual parallel arm randomized controlled trial that we normally do. It's a three-way crossover study. And the nice thing about a three-way crossover is allows, it means that every person gets every drug. So you get a random sequence, pioglitazone, citagliptin, and canagliflozin. And we look at the HbA1c, the weight, the side effects on each of these drugs in that sequence. So it allows us to look at within person difference. And importantly, what we did in this study, which was really interesting and I've come on to, is actually ask the patient which drug they preferred. And because they've been on all three, they could say of the three drugs, which one they preferred and why. So what we did um, was take people who had um, metformin or dual therapy with metformin and sulfonylureas, those sort of common combinations with moderate to poor diabetes control who needed additional treatment and then we randomized them to these drugs and they got them in sequence for about 16 weeks each. So if you remember that first hypothesis was around BMI and whether or not you respond differently to pioglitazin and citagliptin. So we showed exactly what we'd hypothesized and in fact the, we showed exactly the same effect size that we saw in the observational data. So what you can see here is that if your BMI is over 30 you respond better to pioglitazone. And if it's under 30, you respond better to citagliptin. And the difference is about three millimoles per mole or 0.3% in, in percentage terms, HbA1c. And we see very similar results for the EGFR data. So if your EGFR is above 90, you respond better to canagliflozin. And if it's 60 to 90, you respond better to citagliptin. And again, the difference is about three millimoles per mole. Now, those are not large differences, but those are differences that we can predict for free. We know this data is sitting in the data, um, sitting in our database. We don't have to go and spend money on doing fancy biomarkers. We've got this data. It we could tell us that someone is more likely to respond to one drug or another. So I mentioned we went on and looked at patient preference. Um, and so we asked the patients, which, which of the three drugs did they prefer? And it was a reasonable even split across the three drugs, but more people preferred canagliflozin than citagliptin than pioglitazone. But still, um, a quarter of people preferred pioglitazone. When we look at what side effects people had, um, they were as you might predict. So with pioglitazone, there was more weight gain reported. Uh, for canagliflozin, there was actually more side effects reported. And for citagliptin, people actually surprisingly here didn't tolerate, so they actually stopped the citagliptin early. 
when we then delve into the side effects on the on the three drugs, what we could see was um, if we just focus here on 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 this, that the people who were given pioglitazone were the ones who had the most weight gain. Um, the people who were um, had the most side effects with citagliptin, those side effects were to do with nausea, and the people who were given canagliflozin. These drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors, that you will be coming across a lot now, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, they have a lot of side effects. So 30% of patients notice that they pass more urine, that they complain of more thirst, about 25%, that they get feel dehydrated and about a 15% risk of thrush. So whilst they're amazing drugs, they have a lot of side effects and people certainly report those side effects. When we asked people what was their preferred drug, and actually we did this without them knowing what their HbA1c was, they, they chose the, the drug they preferred was the drug that they had the best diabetes control on um, without knowing what their diabetes control was. So they obviously felt better um, with a lower HbA1c. So these drugs, which are equally effective when we don't take into account preference, we're seeing that people are choosing their preferred drug with the lower HbA1c. And then um, and also, and maybe not surprisingly, their preferred drug was also the one that had the fewest side effects. What surprised me um, and certainly made me reconsider my assumptions, because um, because we we often make decisions for patients. Um, so so generally, when you look in guidelines or you think about how you might treat patients, we may, we say, well, if someone who's obese, they've got a BMI over thirty, they're not going to want a drug that makes them put on weight. So as a result, I certainly have done this. I bet my colleagues do this and um, that, that we don't then consider giving a drug like pioglitazone, which causes weight gain to someone who's overweight or obese. And yet the quarter of the patients who preferred the pioglitazone put on weight, but for them putting on weight, was offset by the feeling better, the lower side effects than they got on the other drugs. So I think this is interesting and certainly makes me think that we shouldn't presuppose what our patients want um, and we should ask them. Okay, so that was the TriMaster study. And what that really establishes, I think beyond doubt, is that simple clinical measures like BMI, EGFR does determine how people respond to drugs. and yet we don't use that information in how we decide on what drugs to give. So one of the reasons we don't use that information is it's hard to know exactly how that clinical information will, will inform on how people are going to respond to drugs. So what John has done um, as part of this consortium that, that we're involved in is develop some prediction models, and this is just out in Lancet Digital Health, where you put in the clinical parameters, much like we've done for that tree model, and you use that to predict what the estimated HbA1c is gonna be um, six months from now, and what the weight change is gonna be and what the risk of discontinuation is gonna be. And we have that now for this um, comparison of SGLT2 versus DPP4 inhibitor, and John, and others are just working up a model where we can predict for all of the diabetes drugs, uh, which is going to be the best one over the next six months in terms of HbA1c reduction and weight change. So once we have a model that predicts which is the best drug, we could start to use that clinically. And that's what we're going to be bringing into this iDiabetes project. So another aspect of diabetes drugs, of course, is hypoglycemia. So you know that the drugs that cause hypoglycemia are not uh, are, are insulin and sulfonylureas. The other diabetes drugs don't cause hypoglycemia. So the data I'm going to show you now is data from Ruth Cordner, who did this during her PhD with me. Um, and it uses data that's pretty unique to Tay Sidon Fife, actually, which is that we have a data feed from the paramedics from the Scottish Ambulance Service, where we have severe hypoglycemia data and A&E attendance data. So we can use ambulance call-out data to give a very concrete um, endpoint in terms of 
whether or not someone has had a severe hypo, which is defined as requiring um, external assistance. But here we're saying that required a paramedic to come out and see them. So we look actually across people with type 1 diabetes, but the focus here is type 2 diabetes, insulin treated type 2 diabetes, and then sulfonylurea treated type 2 diabetes. And we're actually interested in the different sulfonylureas, as will be um, apparent. So this data, this table shows the, the hypo rates. And remember, this is severe hypo rate um, in terms of calling out the paramedics. And this is the rate per thousand person years. So someone with type 1 diabetes, the rate's 32. Um, so 32 patients. So um, of 1,000 patients, 32 will call out a paramedic in a year. Um, so it's actually uh, a 3% or 3 in 100 per, per individual. So in type 2 diabetes, insulin-treated type 2 diabetes is less because, of course, they have residual insulin production from their own pancreas, which protects them from hypoglycemia. And then the rates with sulfonylureas are less again. So it's about a third. Sulfonylurea-treated patients are about the third of what they are with insulin. When you look across the different sulfonylureas, the one that we use most, glyclozide, is not bad. Um, it's much better than this drug, labenclamide, which we don't actually use very much in the UK, but this is widely used in the US where they call it gliburide. So it's a bad drug and it causes a lot of hypoglycemia. Glyclozide is good. What's amazing is modified release glyclozide. Um, and as a result of this study, this now is the only sulfonylurea I prescribe. But what we're able to do is not just identify which are the good drugs and which aren't. We can actually, like we've just seen with the drug response data, we can develop prediction models for risk of hypoglycemia. So this is um, one of the models that we've used, and it just shows um, what your risks are in relation to your clinical characteristics. So if, you're, if you've had diabetes for longer, you're more at risk. If you're older, you're more at risk. If you've got low HbA1c, you're more at risk. And if you're male, you're protected. Um, and that's contrast insulin treatment, where if you're male, you're more at risk. So males have lower hypo rates for some reason that we don't understand. And they actually respond better in terms of glucose reduction um, than, than, than women. So now we have a model and we've validated this model. Um, we developed the model in Tayside and validated it in Fife. That means we can now take an individual like our obese man from, from Dundee and predict his hypo risk should he be prescribed these different drugs. So for him, he's got a, a, a lowish risk if he's given a sulfonylurea because he's young. Um, and because his HbA1c is quite high, his risk is low generally. So his risk, if he's treated with insulin, is about 0.17% per year of requiring the paramedics. Sorry, 1.7% per year in requiring the paramedics. Whereas this, this older man who's got some impaired renal function is actually tightly controlled. If he were on insulin, he would have a 7% chance per year of re requiring the paramedics. And that's pretty high. Um, and it may be on that basis we would uh, reduce his insulin dose, let his HbA1c come up a bit, or think about alternative treatments for him. Okay, um, so I'm now going to just move on to the genetics, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. Um, there's, a, there's a lot I could tell you about genetics. Um, this slide is sort of a summary slide that sums up the last 20 years of my research life. Um, and the reason I, I show this is to show that basically for all of the diabetes drugs, apart from SGLT2 inhibitors, where we've still not really found anything yet, for all of the, the other diabetes drugs, we have genetic variants now that explain a reasonable difference in HbA1c response. So, for example, here, 0.5% difference in response in, in response to metformin, 0.7% in HbA1c in TZDs, sulfonylureas, GLP-1 receptor agonists. And we have genetic variants that are associated with increased risk of side effects. So metformin, as some of you will know, causes diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, bloating. Um, and and we, we've got genetic variants involved in the transport of, these, of metformin in the gut that markedly increases your risk of side effects if you carry those variants. 
I'm just going to pick one example just because it's 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 new um, and this is around the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So, you know, of course, we've talked about these injectable drugs, very good, very potent, um, increasingly used. What Adam Dowd has done, um, so he's a PI in the division in population health and genomics, is look at genetic variants and that people might carry and see how they impact on how people respond to, to the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So we looked at a couple of genetic variants that um, alter function of the GLP-1 receptor, which seems a logical place to start, given that's where the GLP-1 receptor agonists bind. And if you look at this variant, the Pro-7 leucine, um, sorry, if you look at this variant, the Gly-168 serine, he shows that um, if you carry one copy of this variant, your HbA1c reduction is about 0.1% lower um, than if you don't carry that variant. Um, sorry, 0.1 millimole per mole lower. So it's a small difference. If you carry two copies, of course, you have double the difference. So it's a small effect, but this is common. This is present in about 30 to 40 percent of people. What what we actually see when we look in a different way, when we do a, an analysis, where we look at rare variants in the genes, we find a, a collection of, um, of a, a signal that points to this gene, arresting beta-1, impacting on how people respond to GLP-1 receptor agonists. And this is showing the, the difference in effect size between um, people who carry these variants or people who don't. And you've got HbA1c's here of about 0.9% versus about 1.3%. So we're starting now to see much bigger differences in um, in people who carry these variants. And this is largely driven by this variant. And what's interesting is, although this is relatively rare in Europeans, it's very common in Latinos. So you might anticipate that this variant will have a much bigger population contribution in terms of how people respond to these drugs. Um, but we've yet to find a Latino population on whom we can define GLP-1 response and genetics. So we, 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 we're not totally clear on that. But when you look at the combination of that Gly-168 serine and the arrest in beta-1 together, we can see that we're explaining about 0.3% difference in HbA1c or a third of the mean effect that we see with avaglutide or about the half of the effect that we see with DPP-4 inhibitors. So again, just purely by knowing someone's genetics, we can start to say whether someone's more likely or not to respond to a drug. Okay, um, so I mentioned in that first slide that diabetes isn't just a drug of glucose, um, isn't just a disease of glucose, it's a cardiometabolic disease. Um, so, and I, I said in that ESDADA guideline that we actually now have treatments where if we know someone has cardiometabolic or cardiorenal disease, that, that we have specific treatments. So we know if someone has heart failure, they should get an SGLT2 inhibitor. If we know if someone has coronary artery disease, they should get either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they have proteinuria or if they have chronic kidney disease, they should get an SGLT2 inhibitor. And if they have fatty liver and particularly fibrosis, um, then the, the evidence isn't quite so strong, but certainly there's good evidence that pyoglitazone or semaglutide can reduce liver fat and might prevent progression of fibrosis. So if we uh, could better identify who these people are, then we already have a, a, a way to target treatment to people. And one way that we might be better at identifying these people who are at risk is by using some biomarkers, some blood tests that you will be familiar with. So NT pro BMP, high sensitivity troponin, um, obviously proteinuria or albuminuria, and the, the, the fibrosis markers that form part of the intelligent liver function test. So FIB4, that, or deriving a FIB4 score and using the ELF early liver fibrosis markers. We might also use genetics. And what I'm putting this, this, these, these term here, PRS or polygenic risk score, is something that um, I think is going to be increasingly useful for helping us identify people at risk of all sorts of different diseases. And I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about the PRS that we're planning to use for coronary artery disease. So on, the, on this plot, we can see um, a group of people who are 
male, age 40 to 54. And the plot is showing us the instance of coronary artery disease over a 10 year period. And this uses clinical risk um, and a genetic risk derived from a polygenic risk score. So the people who have a high clinical risk and they have a high genetic risk are the group shown in red. So, so these are the group who you would expect clearly to have the highest risk, and they do. And the people in green are the ones who've got a low clinical risk and a low genetic risk. So they have very low risk of going on to get coronary artery disease. But there are these two groups that are interesting. So there's the, the purple group are the group who have low clinical risk on the basis of clinical risk scores, but they have a high genetic risk. And you can see their risk is uplifted, up classified towards the high risk group. Whereas the group who've got the low clinical, um, who have a high clinical risk, but a low genetic risk score, have a downgraded risk much closer to the, the low clinical risk group. So this is quite a striking example of how polygenic risk score could add to the clinical risk score to help us target or identify people at risk. And what Ify Mordi has done, um, he has take the population of people with diabetes in Tayside on whom we have genetics and look at their risk in relation to their genetic risk scores or polygenic risk scores. So what he's done here is taken the group of people who have a low risk, i.e. well, a lowish risk, a lower intermediate risk below 20% for coronary artery disease. And that group actually have an average risk of 7%. If you take the, if you look at the group who have a high genetic risk score, their risk is increased up to 14% from 7%, whereas the group with the low genetic risk score is reduced right down to 2%. So genetic risk score or polygenic risk score here could be really helpful in helping us decide who are the people that should be getting GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, in the next and the final five minutes, um, an implementation framework. How are we going to take everything I've talked about and start to use it to improve diabetes care? So that's what I was talking around when I mentioned eye diabetes. So eye diabetes stands for intelligent diabetes, and we blatantly nicked John Dillon's intelligent liver function test idea here. So eye diabetes is using enhanced phenotyping to be to enable better precision diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of diabetes. So we recognize the complex etiologies and multimorbidities of diabetes, and we dissect these out using simple clinical measures plus biomarkers plus genetics and that that allows us to target treatment to the particular groups and the reason we can do this so hopefully so successfully um, is that we have that we have a clinical informatics system across scotland called sky diabetes so we have all the data on everybody with with diabetes in scotland and we use that data clinically but we never use that data to try and decide who are the people who should be targeted for different treatments. We have a patient platform called My Diabetes My Way that's used by 60,000 people now across Scotland. And we have linked in with a spin-out company, which is a University of Dundee spin-out company called My Way Digital Health. We've already developed dashboards and precision prediction models. So we were awarded um, at the end of last year, start of this year, three million pound from the CSO. And this project started in July. And we are in the process of developing our systems with a view to this going live in the summer of next year. And what we're gonna do is essentially take the entire diabetes population of Tayside and cluster randomize those by GP practice. And um, there will be about 10,000 people randomized to enhanced phenotyping, eye diabetes care, and the, the rest will get their usual diabetes care. The enhanced diabetes care will get some additional blood tests and will use those blood tests and their clinical features to help inform what drugs should be used and in real time monitor those patients and send alerts if there is anything concerning around their clinical data. Now, the whole purpose of the randomization is to allow us to evaluate whether or not this is effective. So we will be evaluating this data in terms of efficacy for hospitalization and HbA1c and kidney function, 
Um, and in terms of health economics. So, because it's all very well spending three million pounds, we might hope to improve diabetes care, but can we do it in a cost-effective way? And if we can, then we want to roll this out across Scotland. So this is what we're doing, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but it hopefully allows you to see how we can start to do things like use the prediction models for what, how people respond well to drugs, or use prediction models for hypoglycemia, or look at patient adherence to drugs and send alerts if people are not taking their medication, and use biomarkers like BMP and the polygenic risk score to allocate people to SGLT2 inhibitors, or GLP-1 receptor agonists, or identify people with liver fibrosis and target them to get pyoglitazone or semaglutide. So that's now the idea where we can tease out different groups and target them more appropriately. And what we're developing is essentially um, a, a decision support engine, a risk engine that will take information from Sky Diabetes, take all those blood tests that we do, um, crunch the numbers and predict who's gonna, which, which would be the right drug for an individual, which will be then be relayed on a dashboard available to clinicians and to patients. This is the IQ engine just to show that it's complex. I'm not gonna go through any details there. And that's what we're now in the process of developing, ready to implement next year. And this is a mock-up of what I think the dashboard might look like. This patient, when you go into the dashboard, there's a clear recommendation that they should start embicliflozin and stop their glycoside and their ramipril dose should be increased. And if you clicked on that, it would tell you why where they've got a high pro-BMP and they've got reduced ejection fraction and they're at risk of hypoglycemia um, with their HbA1c of 51. And because they've got heart failure, they should get ramipril or their dose should be increased. So that is all I wanted to say. That's um, our grand plan and that will kick off next year. Um, there's obviously lots of people to thank. On the left is uh, many of my, my group. Um, on the right is the iDiabetes team. That was our kickoff meeting we had at the Malmaison. And these are the, the funders I've had over the years. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ewan. That's amazing stuff. Um, and I think really nice uh, you know, sort of longitudinal view of where we were, where we've come to, where we're going. I think that's, that's really nice. One of the strengths that you, you have here and and you've been instrumental in building this uh, along with predecessors and colleagues is, is how much data you have and how much buy-in you have from the patients to be able to use the, use the tools and all, all that data. And as a, as a specialty that's trying to get to where you're getting, you're at now, it looks like you know, we, we feel a little bit that we're a long, long way behind um, and we wanna catch up. But I think it's important to recognize that this is the summation of decades of work. And when when was the start of all this? You know, sky diabetes and the it's the, the seeds of all this must be twenty five years ago, is it? Yes, it it was. Um, I can't, when did Dart start? Dart started in nineteen ninety six. Um, so yeah, so twenty five years, pretty spot on. Um, so so yeah, you're quite right. I mean, the, the, this is very much uh, what has is the end product of many years. Um, of work. So as you know, Andrew Morris set up darts um, and that then evolved as a Scotland wide resource. Um, we have a clinical system that I think is amazing in, you know, if, if I look after, if I see a patient who was looked after in Glasgow last week, I can see all of their clinical information, their blood pressure, everything from their prime, from the GP system. I mean, it, it's fantastic. But what's interesting is that it's a, it's a brilliant clinical system and we use it all the time clinically and we've got all that data, but we never use the data beyond just showing it to people. So that's really what we're trying to harness here. A lot of what we're doing is not, you know, a lot of the decision support is, is nothing amazing. It's just like, hey, this person's kidney function is getting worse. You know, we, we, the Sky Diabetes knows that it's in the system, but we just don't do anything about it. So why not just set up an alert for that? Um, so some of it's clever, some of it's prediction modeling, but a lot of it isn't. It's just highlighting some key things that probably should be alerted anyway. Yeah, 
and, and, on, and on that thread, um, I hear myself say a lot to medical students or to people sitting in my clinic that if, if medicine was easy, we just have, let a computer do it and make decisions based on just plugging things in. And what it really needs is a doctor with experience and all the rest of it. But perhaps you're suggesting otherwise. No, I'm not. No. Uh, so, I, and I think that's really important. So everything that we're going to be doing here is just giving some additional information to the to the nurse or to the GP to discuss with the patient. Um, I mean, particularly for, for, for diabetes, and this applies really to all co complex disease, it's complex. Um, and there's an art to, to medicine as much as there is a science. Um, so I think, you know, we, we are just going to be saying this drug looks like it would probably work better than the other drugs. Have a discussion with your patient about that. Now, they may, after that discussion, decide not to use that drug because there's many other features of that drug that, that the patient doesn't doesn't want to use um so so yeah so i i think all we can do here is is better inform that discussion rather than we're certainly not trying to dictate that discussion and we're being quite careful in how we word the advice that we give which isn't give this drug it's this is what we think is the best drug um so no i think it's a really good point tom yeah, you, the um, your IQ engine that you showed the the little you know just a brief snapshot of it uh, is complex enough. But um, one of the things that computer algorithms are not great at is nuance. Exactly. Uh, I think that's really what uh, what you're saying there. Yeah. Um, we've got a good uh, fifty people in the room. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, there are a number of diabetes experts. I can see names around here. Anybody want to challenge anything that uh, that you and us said? That's always good sport. Oh, Alison, uh, Alison Dicker uh, says, interesting talk. Thank you. Were patients in the trimester study blinded to the drug or was it open label? Just wondering if it was open labeled, how do you account for patients potentially accessing publicly available reports of side effects, et cetera, and impact that could have on side effect reporting and patient preference? Good question, Alison. And yes, they were blinded. Um, and that's what was well we think was was so nice about the study. So they didn't know what they were on. Everybody was blinded to it. Um, and they made their choice of their preferred drug blinded to the drug. Um, and then it was unblinded and that information was given back to the patient and the GP. And the GPs loved it because they basically were then given all of this information, said, you know, this is how someone's responded and this is their preferred drug. Um, and obviously that's what patients were then given. Um, so... I mean, it, there's still the potential, of course, for people to to go and read up on the on the three drugs that are in the study and work out which one they're on. Um, but I don't think generally people would have done that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so it is blind, and therefore hopefully that's valid. Um, and I should have said very excitingly those those we've we've actually got that study published as a back to back publication in Nature Medicine. There you go. Which one of my nature medicine studies are you talking about? But the, the, they're, they're both in the same journal. They're easy to find. I, yes, as we say in conversation all the time. Rory, um, you who are, you have your hand up and your camera yeah, on. Yeah, I very rarely talk about my nature medicine paper, I'm afraid, Tom. I have to <laughs> leave all of that to, to, to you. And what I was going to say, Tom, is, is the other thing that I guess it alludes to um, is this idea that you know, we live by guidelines, don't we, in practice broadly across all specialities. And yet if you look, certainly in diabetes, you look across the UK, but you look across the world globally, less than 50% at target. And actually, the, the longer you are in disease duration, the longer it takes for someone to initiate the change in therapy. And the higher the HbA1c, I mean, the, the last data from NHANES in the US showed that if you're on three agents and your HbA1c was above 9%, it still took over six months before the majority of people had any change for their therapy whatsoever. So as a physician group, we say we love guidelines, and yet our adherence to those guidelines is terrible, broadly. And it would be interesting to see what happens in the other specialties and the other fields uh, in this space, because we just don't seem to follow them. And I know, you know, I guess Tom can talk about hypertension guidelines and what people come in in that area, and, and maybe perhaps people are better at taking these drugs, but it, it's very clearly a problem in the field. And this is hopefully uh, going to address some of those. Yeah, and I think 
your comment about not adhering to guidelines and reluctance to change and the inertia and dragging of heels is not just limited to diabetes at all. And in my own field, we've got data showing that the adherence to, for example, NTM infection guidelines uh, is less than 10 percent. And we seem to accept that. Um, and the time it takes to go for, for being diagnosed with severe asthma to getting a biologic in England and Wales, at least, is about six years, which seems ridiculous. But it, that's the data. Um, and I, I think, we're, you know, as you say, we like guidelines. We say we're doing them. But actually, when you dig, just scratch the surface, you discover that there are all these issues that are that are that where, that where there's big delays. And, 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 and lack of adherence. It's a complex thing, and it's not, uh, there's lots of reasons behind it, but we need to look at it um, and try and fix it, which is what you're doing. It's amazing. Good stuff. I'm going to draw things to a conclusion. Um, one of the things that you was talking about there is genetics. And as a beautiful segue into next week's talk, Catherine McWilliam from the genetics department is going to come and talk to us about the improvements in the genetics department that they've been working on for a, a couple of years now. One of my personal bugbears, and I'll lay it out there, was the that genetics had to be requested on a piece of paper when everything else is on the ice, and the reports come on pieces of paper when everything else comes on ice, and duplicate reporting. That's all being fixed. Um, Catherine's going to tell us how to request things, where to request things, how to speak to geneticists, how to get interpretation of the test results, and and uh, and about the efforts they've gone through so that we can actually you know, digitalize these results and we can find them. Really important stuff. It's all well and good looking at one of uh, Ewan's nature papers to discover which which genes lead to what treatment but if you don't if you can't get the test where are you so thank you very much for your attendance thanks Ewan again for the uh, in very fascinating talk next week um, see you again same time same place if you'd like to talk at Grand Rounds please get in touch we have a couple of slots empty for the rest of this until and the run up to Christmas and then lots of slots in the new year thanks everyone and I'll see you again next time cheers thanks Tom